Shalom everyone, hope everyone's doing well. Bezat Hashem, today in Mesechet Sanhedrin we're going to learn Tetvav Mudbet 15b. And we're going to have three sections in today's learning. We'll start uh, the, the bottom two dots of the page, about three lines from the bottom. First section we'll discuss is a uh, sugya dealing with the Shoah Niskal, how we know that it needs to be adjudicated by 23 judges. Second section we'll deal with are the other animals that potentially have to be put to death as well. They're wild animals. Three, three shitot, two different ways of explaining Rabbi Yezra and the Amoraim. And the final section we'll deal with is when the Mishnah moves on to say the things that require courts of 71, which begins with a, a shevet, a tribe that sins. We'll have to figure out exactly what that's referring to as well, which will really lead us into tomorrow's sugya. So Bezat Hashem, our learning today and always should be as a refuah shlema, as a Sechut uh, for a speedy, quick, and full recovery for Yaakov ben Dina. And we should only hear Besorot Tovot. Let's start the bottom of Tetvav Mud Aleph, Shor Neskal Be'asrim Mishlosha. So we had discussed at the end of last week regarding an animal that has relations with a person, the Suras Perovea Zachar. So now we move on in the Mishnah to discuss how we know that Shon Eskal, which is an animal that killed a person, how we know that such an animal requires a court of 23 to adjudicate its case and not a smaller court. How do we know that? Now, really, this is based on a pasuk. Before we begin this sugya, let's take a look at the pasuk. This is important to understand the backstory here in terms of the pasuk. This is in Pashat Mishpatim. The pasukim tell us, <clears throat> Here. It says if an ox, it's 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 parasha mishpatim. And it tells us in Perik Chafalif, Pasuk says, if the animal kills a person, it was habitual damager, kills a man or a woman, the ox is stoned, and also the owners die. That's what it means literally. And then the Pasukim go on to say, if the Literally means if, but we're going to translate as when. The owners will pay the atonement or the assessment. That's what they would have to, have to pay. Is the owner of the ox. So the way we understand the pasuk is like this. The pasukim is that if a person's ox kills another person, the ox is killed. It's stoned. It means there's a judgment and they determine the ox is stoned, which we're saying here is with a court of 23. Now the way we interpret also the owners will die, the owners of the ox, it doesn't mean that they'll actually be killed, but rather they have to make restitution by paying what's called kofer. They have to pay kofer, which is a restitution assessment for the person who was killed. Now the, the drasha here seems to be just as in begamba alav yumat, the way we're understanding it is, if the owners would kill somebody, they would be put to death with a court of 23, because in this context, it does not mean they're put to death. That's the assumption. But rather, there's just a restitution payment. So too, Hashor Yisakel, the ox, when it's stoned, it needs to be adjudicated by a court of 23. So it's from this comparison. And the challenge the Gemara is going to ask is, maybe really you learn the Psukim Kipshutam, like the simple Pshat, and the owners need to be put to death, and you have no source then that the ox needs to be adjudicated with a court of 23 when it kills somebody. So how do you know to take it out of the simple understanding and then to deduce that it needs a court of 23 to adjudicate this case? So let's see that inside. The ox that is to be stoned because it killed somebody, this is the Mishnah, needs a court of 23. And the way we understand it is, you don't actually kill the owners, but it means he has to make restitution. But if he would kill, 
That's what the drasha of the pasuk is. If he were to kill somebody, he would be put to death with the court of 23. So kimitata ba'alim, just like that, kach mitata shor, so too regarding the death of his animal, which is because it killed somebody, requires the court of 23. But the reason we're able to make this drasha, to teach that you need a court of 23 to adjudicate this animal's uh, situation, is because it's not meant to be read kipshuto, as kipshuto is not true, it's the owners are not killed in this case. So Amr Abai le Rav, Abai turned to Rav and he said, I don't understand the drasha. How do you know that the words, the owners will die, is meant to teach us this idea, since that they don't actually die, it must be it's to reveal to us that the ox is like them if they would kill, and they needed to be put to death. Also, the ox needs 23 people to adjudicate its case, turning to Tetvav Mudbet, Maybe what the Pasuk is telling us is if my property kills somebody, my ox kills somebody, I'm chayav mita. And don't take it out of kipshuto, the simple pshat. Maybe the simple pshat is true. If my property kills somebody, I'm chayav mita. And you have no source that the ox's fate is to be determined by a court of 23. So Rava answered to Abaye Im Kain, if that's true, Lichtov, the Torah could have just said, Vigam ba'alav. It could have said that the shor yisakel, the ox will be stoned, vigam ba'alav, and also its owners, v'lishtok, and be quiet. The fact that it says yumat, an extra word, must be to teach us not that the owners are killed, but rather for the drasha, which is that just like the judgment of a person who kills would be adjudicated with 23, also the ox is to be adjudicated with a court of 23. But the Gemara says, This doesn't really work. The Gemara challenges Rava's answer. Because if the Torah would have just said, I would have said, I would have said, maybe, just as the ox in this case is killed with stoning, which is one of the four types of deaths in court, administered by the courts. So I would have said, also, the owner of the animal. means Maybe really, Pshad is the owner of the animal is killed. You don't have a source that the adjudication of this ox is for, with, with 23. I, why does it say yumat? It's because if you wouldn't have said yumat, so then you would think that just as the ox is killed with, uh, with skila, also the owner of the animal is killed with skila, biskila, so, 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 and therefore we need the word yumat to teach us actually he's killed with chenek because usually when the Torah teaches the word yumat, it means strangulation, which is a lighter level of punishment. But maybe indeed challenges the Gemara back to Rava. Abai's question is still good because yumat is necessary to simply teach us that the owner is killed, actually in this case, with which death? That's why it says yumat to teach us that it's with chenek and not skila like the ox. But the Gemara says, that's not a question, because would you have ever thought that the owner of the animal should be put to death with skila, in this case, when his animal kills? We know even if a person kills himself, meaning he goes and kills somebody directly himself, the punishment for murder is death by sword, which is a lighter level punishment. Mamono biskila, would you have ever entertained the idea that when my animal, my money kills somebody, I get skila? So that's not a hava amina. And therefore, we're back to the answer really, which is that you, you, the, the purpose of the verse, as we just said, is the gamba love you mut, that's a revelation. You mut is to teach us. The extra word, extraneous word, is not necessarily to teach me that it's not skila, because that's obvious, as if I murder somebody, I'm not going to get skila. Certainly, if my animal murders somebody, I'm not going to get skila. It must be, it's there to teach us that I'm not going to be killed, but rather, as Rav is trying to say, that there's this comparison that the ox also is adjudicated with 23 judges. Asks the Gemara, But maybe I'll tell you like this. The reason that Torah writes Yumat is really not to teach me 23 for the ox's judgment, but rather la'akule iluya, is to provide a leniency for the owner of the ox. Maybe really the owner of the ox is killed. And the word Yumat is to teach us a leniency. Because since if the owner of the ox would kill himself, he'd get sayif, which is the death by beheading, the sword. So comes the Torah to teach me, he doesn't get sayif, rather he gets chenek. 
that instead of saif, he gets chenek strangulation. So the Gemara says, Anicha, this is not a question. If you say that chenek is more strict, so then this is not going to be a question. Because what we're going to say is, again, if he himself would kill, he would get saif, certainly he can't get chenek strangulation, which is more chamur, and therefore this question doesn't start. And therefore the verse must not be to teach us that principle, but rather it must be to teach us that the ox is judged by 23. But there is a shita who holds. Strangulation is less strict, is more lenient than beheading. So according to that shita, maybe that's what the pasuk is to teach us. So as to teach us that he doesn't get saif, rather he gets the more lenient punishment of chenek, of strangulation. And then that's what you need it for. You don't have a source again that the ox is judged by a court of 23. So the Gemara says, Don't let that enter your mind. Because the next part of the Pasuk, which we read, it says over there, Him kofer yushat alav. It says, the owner of the animal has to make restitution for the person that was killed by his animal. But the way you're trying to understand it, that it's to teach us, as you're trying to say, that he doesn't get saif, rather he gets chenek, strangulation, and he is put to death. You don't have a source for our halacha of 23 for the ox. We know the Pasuk tells us, It says you cannot take restitution. If somebody is to be put to death, there's no concept of restitution. So it must be the fact that Torah says that there is restitution here. He's not going to be put to death. And the way you have to understand the verse is that it's a source that the ox is killed with a horde of 23. The Gemara says, Adrav, you could say the exact opposite. Maybe that's exactly what the Pasuk is teaching you. Katal ihu, that where this person kills, meaning where a person would go and kill somebody, it would not be sufficient to pay kofar, rather he needs to be put to death. But maybe what the Chidush of the Pasuk here is like this, really he is liable to mita. However, katal shoro, where his ox kills, lifrok nafshei b'mamona, He's given the option to redeem his soul with his money. I Meaning, really, he should be put to death, like we said, with chenek. He should be strangled. But if he wants to pay, he could pay. But then it comes out, still, the verse would be teaching us. If he wants to pay up, he could pay up to redeem himself. But then you still don't have a source, necessarily, that the ox is judged with a court of 23. So Ella Mar Chizkiya rather Chizkiya says Vchintan Dve Chizkiya and the Beit Midrash of Chizkiya taught Amar Kra it's a pasuk mefurash that tells us this person is not put to death and therefore you can't explain the pasuk that way because the pasuk says it says Motu Matamake it says someone that strikes another and kills him should be put to death Rotzeach who he is a murderer now those words are excessive. So al go you only kill somebody if he murders someone else. You cannot kill him if his ox kills somebody else. So therefore, back to the original verse, when it says, it can't mean he's put to death based on that drasha we just made. It must be it's there to teach us, just like if he killed somebody in a different case, he'd be adjudicated in a court of 23. Also his ox, in this case where it kills someone, is adjudicated in a court of 23, but he's not indeed put to death. So the Gemara now wonders... Let's ask the following Shayla question. Shor Sinai Bekama. We just did this in the Parshio talking about Har Sinai. By Har Sinai, the Psukim tell us that there was a border around the mountain, and anyone who approached, both man or animal, be, during, to that border when there was the time that it was prohibited during Kabbalat Torah, was going to be put to death. Now, it doesn't mean that there was some like electrocution that occurred, but rather the courts would adjudicate him and put him to death, the man or animal. So the question the Gemara wonders now is, Shor Sinai Bekama. How many people would need to adjudicate if an animal approached the mountain when you're not supposed to, to put that animal to death? Mi gamar sha'a mi doro, do we compare that temporary isur by Har Sinai to the future generations of Ashur Niskal, just as an ox that kills someone is adjudicated with a court of 23, also that ox that touched the mountain would be put to death by a court of 23. Although, or do we not compare them? So Tashma, the Gemara says, I'll bring you a proof. It says, whether it's a behema, an animal or a man, touches the mountain, it will not live. And we say, therefore, a comparison. Ma'ish bechaf gimel, just as a person who would have approached beyond the limits he wasn't meant to, should be adjudicated by 23 to put him to death. Af behema bechaf gimel, also an animal would require a court of 23 to adjudicate the case. And therefore, in that story too, you'd have to have a court of 23. Okay. Now we had in the Mishnah, after this statement, 
a continued discussion regarding other wild animals, right? Where an ox kills somebody, so you need a court of 23 to put it to death. But then the Mishnah said a series of other wild animals, and it said as follows. All of these wild animals, the Tanakhama said, They're put to death with a court of 23. Rabbi Eliezer Omer Kola Kodem Lahorgan Zacha. Rabbi Eliezer says, anybody that proceeds to kill it has merited. We'll see exactly what that means. Rabbi Akiva Omer Mitatan Besri Mishlosha. Rabbi Akiva says the court of 23 is required. Now, after this next week, yeah, we'll figure out exactly how Rabbi Akiva is arguing Tanakama. But what the Gemara does here is it explains to us when does Rabbi Eliezer say Kola Kodem Lahorgan Zacha? Regarding these other wild animals, is it when the other wild animals kill somebody? Or is it even if they don't kill somebody, since they're deemed to be dangerous, bichlal, they're considered a danger, a menace to society, and anyone who kills them is merit- meritorious. And there's a fascinating <coughs> the debate that will come out of this if wild animals are considered naturally tame. This is a fascinating discussion for all of those uh, animal owners, and some people will think animals are people, this is a fascinating discussion. Hariva Azeev Chulais. Amr Eish Lakish. Eish Lakish is the first opinion. When does Rabbi Eliezer say, Kolakodem, Kolakodem, Zacha? If anyone kills it first, he is meritorious. Kolakodem, what's the language? Kolakodem, Lorgan, Zacha. It's Rabbi Eliezer's language. He says, Reish Lakish, Vehushe Mito. No, it's only if these wild animals have already killed. Like this. The Tanakhama says, in a scenario where these wild animals killed somebody, it's the same as a shore. Just as a shore needs to be adjudicated by a court of 23. So also, if your pet snake or your pet uh, uh, lion went and killed somebody, it needs to be adjudicated by a court of 23 to put it to death. And on that, Rabbi Ezra comments and says, no, if it killed somebody, anyone who kills it is considered meritorious. It was the good thing to do already. That's considered appropriate. But according to this shita of Reish Lakish, if it would not have killed somebody, so other people would not be allowed to kill it. Even though it is a wild animal, you're not allowed to kill it. So the Gemara says, Alma, we see that Reish Lakish would hold, Kasavar yesh lehen tarbut, that wild animals, lions, tigers, snakes, they could be tamed, v'yesh lehen ba'alim. And since they're not considered a menace to society, unless it goes and kills somebody, revealing that all along it hadn't been a tame animal, you could say it's a tame animal. It could be trained, and therefore it's owned by its owners. It's not considered ownerless, and therefore you have to treat it like a tame animal. You're not allowed to kill it, even according to Rabbi Yezer. That's the position of Reish Lakish. So again, according to Reish Lakish, the Machlok at Rabbi Yezer and the Tanakama is in a scenario where it killed somebody. So Reish Laki, uh, Rabbi Yezer says, look, that's a wild animal. You see all along it was wild. Anyone who wants to kill it could kill it. Forget about it. Tanakama says this needs to be adjudicated by a court of 23, just like an ox that killed somebody. But Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan says no. And I'm going to explain how Rashi learns over here. According to Rabbi Yochanan, the Tanakama holds that where these wild animals killed somebody, you need a court of 23 to adjudicate this case. Now Rabbi Yezer is responding to that and saying, Even if it did not kill somebody, still you would, anyone who killed it would be allowed to, anyone who killed it would be considered meritorious. That's what Rabbi Yezer is responding. So again, according to Rabbi Yochanan, Tanakama is saying where it killed somebody, the snake killed somebody, you need a court of 23 to adjudicate like a case of an ox. On that, Rabbi Yezer responds and says, even if it doesn't kill somebody, anyone who wants to go and kill it, you don't need a court of 23 to adjudicate it. That's the point. Yeah. Even if it didn't kill anybody. Alma Kasavar, now in this shita of Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yezer seems to hold Kasavar, ein lahem tarbut ve'ein lahem ba'alim. That naturally, a wild animal, even if it hasn't shown you know, its dangerous side by killing somebody, it cannot be tamed, and it does not consider, it's not considered as being owned, it's considered hefker, and therefore anybody who wants to kill it is allowed to kill it. Now, tonight, let's look at our Mishnah to try to deduce which shita, Rish Lakish Rabbi Yochanan, is more logical in the words of Eliezer. Tanah, our Mishnah said, Eliezer Omer, Kola Kodem Lahargan Zacha. He says, anybody that proceeds to kill it merits. Now, 
Bishlam of the Rabbi Yochanan, I understand according to Rabbi Yochanan. What does it mean anyone who kills it merits? Lemaizacha, what does it mean that he's merited? It means even if this animal hasn't killed, that's the way that Rabbi Yochanan explains, still this person could kill it. Now, if it hasn't killed anybody, so Minat Torah, it's actually not Chayav Mita like a Shor Niskal, because when an ox is put to death for killing somebody, you can't benefit from that anymore. But here we're saying is, it's dangerous, so whoever wants to kill it could kill it. That's Rabbi Yezra's position even before it killed somebody. So when it says Zacha, I understand, Zacha the Oran. It means he could keep the skins of this animal because this was Hefker. It's not a sore like a Shor Neskal that becomes prohibited in benefit. And therefore, if Yochan, I understand the word Zacha. But according to Reish Lakish, Rabbi Yezra is only saying you could kill it once it's killed somebody. Once it's killed somebody, it's a sore and a you can't benefit from it. So what does Zacha mean? Once it's killed somebody, the rabbis make it that if another person comes and kills it, it's like in the in the place of court. And this becomes something prohibited in Hana'a, just like when the court would stone it, so this individual now would also kill it. But the point then would be that it's now a sur in Hana'a. And if it's a sur, what way are you meritous in this animal? The Gemara answer is, Ma'i Zachar, according to Reish Lakish, what does it mean, Zachar? Zachar le Shamayim. It means that he's done something righteous for Shamayim. He prevented some sort of a damaging force to continue. Tanya Kavati to Reish Lakish, the Gemara says we have a Brayta that supports the position of Reish Lakish because it says in the Brayta, Echad Shor Sheimit, Echad Beima, Vechaya Shemito. Whether it's a shore that killed somebody or an animal that killed somebody, but you see clearly it's specific where it killed. Mechaf Gimel, so Tanakama says, 23 judges are required to adjudicate. Eliezer Omer, Shor Sheimit, Be'ezri Mishlosha, an ox that killed requires 23. The Shar Be'ima, V'chaya Sheimito, but other animals that killed, Kol HaKodem, L'Argan, Zachaba, and L'Shamayim, anyone that kills them is considered Zochel L'Shamayim, because he's acting in place of the courts, and that's considered appropriate. But you see clearly, Rabbi Yezer's comment is not where it didn't kill, specifically where it did kill, like Reish Lakish said, and that's a support to the position of Let's move on now to the third and final section of the day. Oh, sorry, excuse me. Before that, we had in our Mishnah a third opinion. Rabbi Akiva Omer Chulei. Rabbi Akiva said that these animals, these wild animals, need to be adjudicated by a court of 23. Now, that was the Tanakama's position too. So asks the Gemara, Rabbi Akiva, I'm the Tanakama. Rabbi Akiva is the same as the Tanakama. This is a fascinating thing. Of all the wild animals, the Gemara in Mesechet, Baba Kama, tells us that Nachash is Mu'ad La'olam. Nachash, a snake, is considered untrainable. It's always considered wild, uh, untamable. You can't make it tame, you can't domesticate it. So the Machloket between Tanakama and Rabbi Akiva is specifically regarding the snake. According to the Tanakama, it's the same as the others. Just as the other animals, theoretically, they could be trained. And as we explained, if according to the Tanakama, if they kill, so then they have to be put to death in a court of 23. But before that, not necessarily. However, according to Rabbi Akiva, then a common would say you need a court of 23. According to Rabbi Akiva, he would disagree regarding snake. He would say it's nachash le'emu'ad le'olam. It's considered a damaging force forever, always. And therefore, lechura, one second. Sorry. Yeah, and according to Rabbi Akiva, anyone that kills the snake is considered meritorious because that's just considered a wild animal, even if, uh, unlike the other animals, that's the position of Rabbi Akiva. Yeah, you don't need due process in that regard. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting, a snake is untrainable. A lion could be trainable, but a snake might not be able to be trainable. Let's continue. Now, the, this is the third section of the day here. We said in the Mishnah, Ein Danin. So we listed a series of things that now need to be adjudicated by a court of 71. This was the third section of our Mishnah. So the first thing we said was Shevet. We said if a tribe, an entire tribe of the Jewish people does some sort of an Avera, in order to adjudicate this, you need the Sanhedrin Agadola, you need the great Sanhedrin. You can't have a lower capital court of 23. Rather, you need the court of 71. So the Gemara is going to try to figure out, and this will bring us to tomorrow also, what exactly did the Shevet do wrong 
that would necessitate the higher level court to adjudicate its sin and its punishment. So the Gemara says, How did this tribe sin that it requires a court of 71 to adjudicate? It's amazing. See how important Shabbat is. Maybe you'll say it's where a Shevet desecrated Shabbat. That's something so significant that it would need a court of 71 to adjudicate. The problem is, where do we know that the Torah makes a distinction between individuals who sin or a majority, a group of people that sin? That's in Yana Avodat Kochavim. That's in regards to Avodah Zarah. We know that the halacha is if a person does Avodah Zarah by himself as an individual, so he's adjudicated in a court of 23. But if it's a an entire city, it's called Irani Dachat. So then you need the great court of 71 to adjudicate it. But we don't find this similar distinction by Chilul Shabbat. So maybe only by Avodah Zarah is there such a distinction. But that can't be the sin we're discussing because who says if a Shevet does a desecration of Shabbat, it's judged any differently. But Peshar Mitzvot, Mi Palig, regarding other Mitzvot, do we know of such a distinction? Ella, so Gemara says, okay, maybe it means b'shevet she'udach, exactly that. Maybe the case that would require a special adjudication of the court of 71 is where an entire shevet, an entire tribe of the Jewish people, hudach means they engaged in avodah zarah. And when they engage in avodah zarah, it's not like individuals that are judged by a court of 23, rather you need the court of 71. The problem is, lemeimer. This would imply We would adjudicate them like the din of the public, like this, the din of an irani dachat, which is when the majority of a city does avodah zarah. We would judge them differently in a court of seventy-one versus where individuals did it. The issue is, as we're about to show, is that there's no such tana who holds this way. It means the tanaim do discuss this idea of irani dachat of a city that has gone wayward and done avodah zarah. How many people need to be in such a city in order to be adjudicated on this more extreme level? But none of them seem to hold this is, is true by an entire Shevet that does Avodah Zarah. How do we know this? Keman, the Loka Rabbi Yoshia, the Loka Rabbi Yonatan, because it's not like either of the Shittot Rabbi Yoshia or Rabbi Yonatan. The time like the Brayta teaches us. Until how many people would qualify as an Irani Dachat. Again, that means where you have a city that the majority of its inhabitants did Avodah Zarah, how many people have to be involved in that, in that, in that city in order to fit the bill of being an Irani Dachat? One second. How many people need to inhabit the city to be considered Irani Dachat? Exactly. So the Gemara says, Tushitot says the Brayta, the Tanyat Kamosin, Irani Dachat, Mi Yud Ad Kuf, a hundred till, uh, sorry, ten till a hundred people. Now this is very specific. Div Reb Yoshia. Yoshia says, you need to have a city of ten till a hundred people to be considered an Irani Dachat. More than that or less than that is not deemed an irani dachat. So now a shevet is more than that. I mean, a shevet is certainly more, and therefore, according to Rabbi Yoshia, he can't be the Tana of our Mishnah if that's the way you're interpreting the sin of the, of the shevet. Rabbi Yonatan Omer, Mikuf ve'ad rubo shel shevet. So Rabbi Yonatan says, a hundred people till the majority of a tribe. So he says, very specific thing. We'll discuss exactly later what is the pshat in this machloket. But the point is, is that you see clearly that these two shitot, these two tanaim, wouldn't fit with the uh, assumption that we're making that a shevet who does avodah zarah is treated more severely with a court of 71. Even Rabbi Yonatan says it's only irani dachat if the majority of the shevet does avodah zarah. But if it's the entire tribe, it's not treated like that. So you see clearly that can't be the pshat when it says shevet is treated more severely and adjudicated by the court of 71, that it's talking about Avodah Zarah because there's no such shita that exists. And therefore, as we're stopping here, we haven't actually concluded what is the sin we're talking about that would be adjudicated by a court of 71. Now we're stopping the bottom of Tedvav Amud Bet, but we'll pick up tomorrow with the final or the next attempted answer. What is this Avera that would require of a Shevet that has been done by a Shevet that would require the court of 71 to adjudicate and that's what our mission is talking about. Bezat Hashem will pick up tomorrow with that Zayin with Aleph, with a 16A. In the meantime, 
We're stopping the bottom of Tetvav Mudbet, and everybody have a wonderful day.